a man of many names with me here. Um, John Anthony Woods, Jonathan Blake, gentleman Johnny Bingo, John Anthony Blake. But we know you best as John Levine, actor and entertainer for 50 years. Thanks for joining me, John. Jason, it's a pleasure. Um, the book. Um, I've heard about this book for the last couple of years and it's come with quite a lot of excitement. What made you finally decide to write the, this part of your life? Well, I had decided not to write a book for the last 45 years for no other reason than I saw many of the Doctor Who celebrities write books and they didn't really sell very well. And although money was not ever going to be my guide, mm -hmm. I, wouldn't have, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have been as interested in doing it if it was only, only going to sell 100 copies. So 45 years after saying no, I just happened to be talking to Ian, who works very closely with Paul and Dexter um, at Phantom. And he said, you know, if you do ever write a book, give Phantom a thought, because at least they have uh, a wonderful knowledge of the true Doctor Who uh, fans. And so I just suddenly thought, well, I had done all the research for Douglas Canfield's book, and my ghostwriter, Michael Seeley, uh, he actually was the inspiration. He was that, that bolt of... Um, of reality that came along because of the way he put Douglas Canfield's uh, book together made me cry, laugh, and I remember thinking, gosh, I wish I could write like that. Now, I knew I always had a way with words because of my lack of education. I worked twice as hard uh, to get the words, and I know there's a lot of you out there that might not have read or has learned as much as you could have, and let me tell you now, it's never too late to learn. And the fact that I did this, and I'm talking directly to your audience because I know as we've just had in this panel out there, so many of us are lonely, don't know which way we're going. We have no direction in our lives. And that, Jason, is one of the reasons I take this being in Doctor Who so seriously. I've never felt famous. I've never felt handsome and incredible. All I've ever done is tried to get through each day as I now believe God would have intended us to. Now, I'm not an overly religious man, as you know, um, but I do feel lately that having met my son and his wife and my two grandchildren in New Zealand, my life has taken on a totally and utterly beautiful new aspect. And that, I believe, is why I've written the book. And I had to tell the truth. I've decided not to dish any dirt, as you will have noticed. I will. I've not, there's a lot of people that deserve to be dragged down and kicked in the head for the things they've done and the arrogance they've shown. Not a lot of them. There's not, there's only four or five people in the whole Doctor Who thing. They know who they are. And the reason I didn't write about them is because you already know who they are. <laughs> and I don't want my name attached to people that I don't want to belong to. But, but, but it was a point I was interested in, actually, because, I mean, you set out and you write something like this, and you have to be true to yourself to a degree when you write it. So it's around how honest you feel you need to be. And presumably, you've but what you've just said, you felt you, you could be quite honest in this book. Well, I, I, Jason, I, I really feel I have. I mean, first of all, any actor can spin a tale. I mean, like, you know, I used to love John telling his stories. And as you know, the retelling of a story, you add a little bit on for the audience. That's, it's entertainment. The whole word, whether it's video, movie stars, DVDs, whatever, the word entertainment. And that's the word you see, you know, Sony entertainment. So when John Pertwee showed how much he liked having me as a friend, can you imagine, can you, who love the third Doctor so much, imagine what it was like being young John Woods, then John Levine, and John Pertwee saying, I want your friendship and I want to be with you and I want to hear what you've got to say. He was the man that started me on this road of discovery. Jason. I mean, particularly the chapters that you write in, in the book around that sort of time on the show with John. The love just comes you can feel beaming it, you? through the book. It yes. really is. And I love John Pertwee. I love Douglas Canfield, even though he was the biggest director in BBC at that time, but that I was his protege and I didn't know it until he died? How weird is that? He certainly looked after you through the didn't show. Didn't he, though? But that made for that friendship oh. that I think you both had. I still can't believe it. And of course, you know, his son, I am, I'm still in touch with his son, uh, Jogs Canfield, uh, because originally Douglas had called him Jorand, which is a very old medieval name. And of course, Jorand in modern day didn't sound so Jogs called himself Jogs. But yes, yeah, so Douglas Canfield was the man that gave me the inspiration and the opportunity to know that I had more to give than I would have ever thought possible. And so to those four men and my mum and dad, who I now, thanks to the, the lady, the psychic that I met on the cruise line, it was what, 40 years ago now, she said, you must love your mum and dad, even if you hate them, for giving them your life. Because after all, it was my mum's womb and my father's seed 
that made me and the fact that I was born dead and should never be. This is the bit that makes me almost confused. I was dead for one minute and 48 seconds. The doctor had already said to my mum, I'm so sorry, Mrs. Woods, your son is gone. How on earth am I here 78 years later, having achieved all the stuff that you couldn't have done if you were dead? I just find it overwhelming, if the truth were known. Um, it's, um, it's, an, it's a, basically an emotional and truthful account um, of your life, it's fair to say. Um, it must have stirred up some, some very raw emotions for you, John, during the writing yeah. of the book. Well, Jason, the truth is, the truth of yourself can be so painful. I left and abandoned my first wife and my first child. And the guilt I carry now is the guilt I should have carried then. Now, I almost can't find a way with all the words I have in my brain, how do you say sorry to a woman that you made pregnant and then left her? Now, she had a happier life without me, I have to admit that. So for that, I'm happy for her. But with all that went on, I had to tell the people, and I suppose really, if truth were known, I am talking to my ex-wife and my son and my daughter and Jenny, the only woman I've ever loved. Um, I am talking to them. I've dedicated this book to Jennifer. Uh, for all that I wasn't, I beg your forgiveness, and for all that I was, you made me complete. Now, I'm finding it very hard to live without her. I don't imagine she'll see this because she lives in America now. I think she already knows I'm still in love with her, which for some reason I find devastatingly unbearable. I'm not very good at flirtation with ladies, and I think most of you fans know there are no stories about me out there that are naughty or whatever. I've always been what I like to believe, Jason, and I mean this with all my heart. I want to be a decent man. And the fact that I'm a bit outspoken and that I've got this fear of injustice and that I want the bad people brutalized to death. I think bad people that brutalize their children and these men that brutalize their wives, there should be a special camp in hell for them and the misery that it sends. And that's what my problem is. I just see the sadness of everything. I, you know, all these things, all these people that have lost people in circumstances beyond their control. So I felt it was my right and my duty to uphold the loyalty that Douglas Canfield, Barry Letts, John Pertwee, and Roger Delgado instilled in me because of my little butterfly soul. And all the times I had to go outside of the studio and say, John, I can't do it. I can't face it. And John Pertwee would look at me. It's John Pertwee, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know who your favorite doctor is. You must have different doctors because otherwise it wouldn't work. But when you think John Pertwee came along and replaced my father, that's why I talk about John Pertwee. I owe him almost everything. So yes, Jason, to tell the truth as close as one can. Obviously, there are a few things. I have done nothing really evil in my life. A couple of things that I do regret, but they weren't the most awful things. But I do regret them. Ham. How did you arrive at the title for the book? It's a really interesting title, Run the Shadows, Move well, the Sun. Well, I'm going to show off a little bit here now and just say to you, the viewer and the listener, I have loved quotes all of my life. I had no education, so therefore I couldn't write, I could hardly read, and if I could, any word that wasn't in my compass of understanding, mm -hmm. like obtuse, serendipitous, which I learned from Dr. <laughs> I, therefore, missed out one-third of everything I read or any movies I saw. Well, what happened 30 years ago when I was deeply in love with Jennifer? And the irony about Jennifer is I met her when I was with Sylvester McCoy. Sylvester McCoy was with me the very second I fell in love with Jennifer Ann Wegner. That was her name. I was talking to her, and I said, what's your name? She said, Jennifer. And I said, my name's John. And I said, there's a matter of interest. What's your surname? She said, Wegner. And I said, mine's Woods. I said, J-W-J-W. -W. Now, six months into our relationship, when we'd moved in together in Burbank, she lived, come from Milwaukee, I happened to say, Jennifer, you don't happen to have a middle name as well, do you? And she said, yeah. And I said, so do I. I said, what is it? She said, it's Anne. Well, mine's Anthony. J-A-W, J-A-W. Now, to me, that is incredibly stunning. So, I became a runner. Um, I don't mind admitting it now. I had full-blown tuberculosis, ladies and gentlemen. And I got it by being starved to death because I had no money to buy food. 
I was calling bingo in one of the biggest, big, the biggest bingo halls in London, <laughs> where a lot of smokers and a lot of TB was, and that's where I caught my tuberculosis in the Battersea Mecca Bingo Hall. And I can remember the germ going down to this day. It took away my right lung, but only the inside, I understood. I thought the whole lung was gone. I was informed just last week that it was only the internal, which is why I get a grab a breath whenever I talk about it. So the long and the short of it is, one day, and I want you to read my book. Look, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. The money isn't everything. By the time you sold 500 copies, it's not like I'm going to be buy a second-hand car or anything, but it's the, it's the joy of getting this published through Phantom. And I want to thank Dexter as well for being patient with my, uh, my, my, creative imp- my creative impatience. So what happened is, Jason, one day I was standing outside of my lonely, desperate house in Sundry-on-Thames. My wife and two children were gone. I was living on my own. I was out of work, and I knew I was ill, but I didn't know what it was. I'd been laying by a gas fire every night, just in the fetal position, just wanting to die, but never being able to achieve it. Well, one day I was standing outside my little house on on this thing called Vicarage Road, and a bloke ran past me with his running shoes and his shorts and his T-shirt, and I heard the whoosh as he ran past me. Because, you know, just don't know, whoosh. And I looked, and I saw the muscle on his leg, and I've, I've got skinny little legs like my dad had. Anyway, the next day, I thought, I wonder if this is the savior of my life. I went up, even though I was not very well off, I went up to the, uh, the shop, the, the, the only sports shop in Sunbury, and I bought the most expensive pair of running shoes, which in those days was 135 quid, so you can imagine how much they cost today. Long of the story, the story is, I started to become a runner. So the first day, and it's all in the book, but I got out there, and I could only achieve 50 yards. I was dying. I didn't know my lung was collapsing and all that. Anyway, I ended up being a runner for 27 years, six miles a day. Every country, every weather, everywhere I went, I ran six miles a day. There's a picture of me running on my ship just to prove it. I became addicted. And if ever I felt next to God, it was by becoming a runner. Next to being a singer now, the best thing I ever did was run. And I have to say this, this is when religion began to filter into me. I never believed in God, and I certainly didn't believe in Jesus. And if someone came up to me and said, I want to show you God, I would tell them to piss off. Because you can't come up to my door and tell me who God and Jesus is and tell me what I should believe by standing there with a disgustingly worn Bible, which you've most likely not even read. And you know that's true, ladies and gentlemen. These people are not really real. But something happened, and one day, and I just want to just say this quickly, I was in America in a place called Newport News, which is where they repair all the ships because they had the biggest dock. The ship I was on almost sank because we had a crack by the by the uh, the propeller. We were off for three days. Now, I'm not a drinker, but that day I got a bit drunk. Well, drunk to me is a pint and a half. I mean, <laughs> big deal, you know. Long story short, and maybe I, I ended up on this railway bridge, and it was a railway bridge with like a, a wall there, a wall there, a wall there, and another wall there with two motorways going each different way. Now, as a runner, I became fabulous. I could run mountains, anything. I could run jagged rocks. I became fantastic, and it made my life. I'm standing there, and I'm a bit piddled, and and, and I'm sure some of you have had a drink now and again, but I thought, you know what? The one thing I've always loved doing is jumping gaps. Like, what, what do you call it when people jump off walls and over the garages and they like free jumping? You free, free, it is in fact that, yes, free, free, jumping. free jumping. Anyway, yes. very quickly, because it's a long story. I remember thinking, I'm going to jump. I, and I looked, and I thought, it can only be about four feet. So I got next to the wall, and when you're going to run, you get like this to get an, a, 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 a start. Just as I was to run, a car came, and it stopped me. And I thought, fuck that was the moment. So I had to get ready again. I got ready again, and then another car came, and I thought, hang on a minute. There's something I haven't done. Now, this is going to freeze your heart with fear. There's been five times in my life when I've been fearful of death. I went over, instead of running over, just to see what I was going to jump. It was 15 feet wide. (laughs) The reason I'd gone over to look is there was a train. Now, trains in America are like everything in America. There must have been 5,900 carriages on this train. It went under this bridge for almost an hour. I would have jumped, fallen onto that train. No documentary on me at all. I would have died. It was a 40-foot fall. That is when I realized that running had made my life the most exciting thing I've ever done. It's a lovely story. Isn't that just... So I I nearly died. If it hadn't been for that car, I would have been dead today. 
John, the book, obviously, um, how long did it take you to write the book? Just out of it was about, uh, it's 12 months by the time you've actually, and it's every day. It really is, just to let you know, in case you would like to read it. Um, and you, you notice I'm not going to push it. You either love John Levine and Sergeant Benton, or you don't. And I've always accepted that, Jason. You can't have every Doctor Who fan love you. Some of us think we're stupid. Some of us think my character was weak. That doesn't bother me. My mum thought I was good. And the woman I love thought I was good. Oh, and people like yourself, and I can say this, Jason has been with me. He has saved my emotional heart several times when I've been in a bit of a flummox. Because I am a perfectionist, whether we like it or not. Oh, yes. And when you're a perfectionist, life can become quite difficult. <laughs> so that's we've, we've been there through thick and thin, John, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, actually, the, the length of time you to, to write the book um, was interesting. But for me, which is the, the chapter that you got the most joy out of writing? Well, and now, now that is a difficult one, because I'm going to be honest with you. My one vanity is that because I could never write or read or know my alphabet for all my, almost all my life, I have to say that I love the words I've used. Mm. I feel that I've used words that a man with my level of education should never have known existed. Now, that's why I love, um, for example, let me, if I may, pick this up. The thing I love the most is the, the one that um, I saw this quote uh, 30, 40 years ago. I was in Peru, and I met a Dalai Dala Lama. And we were talking about the way people are in the world and how there's so much hate and so many wars and so on that um, I can't even find it in my own book. Um, I don't know where it is. Anyway, it's very briefly, he said to me that he was born in the Himalayas on, on near Mount Everest. And he said to me, we have a saying in, in near Mount Everest that good people shine like the peaks of the Himalayas. Bad people are not seen here for they are shot like arrows by night. <laughs> And I remember thinking, shot like arrows by night. And then, the only other one I love, I'm not, as you know, my lack of education made it very difficult to believe in myself. Excuse me for looking at the book, everybody, but the one thing when my father was at war, um, he was a war hero, and when you see what he did, that Russian convoy was one of the most brutal, apart from Iwo Jima and Guadalcanal for the Japanese theater of war, the Russian convoy was brutal. Uh, my father was on the pom-poms, he was in the inch group, and he had his own, own gun team. And in the book, you will see his whole team getting the medal from George V at Buckingham Palace. Now, I would never have been in Shakespeare because I can hardly speak English, not having my lack of education. I'm better now, I can speak now, but this is the one thing of Shakespeare that goes before my father, who lost every friend he'd had in within four days of this brutal attack. They left with 55 ships, and I think they lost 24 in, in two days. That's a lot of human beings. And this is from Shakespeare's Henry V. Just see this from someone like me, but now I can at least read it. The gates of mercy shall be all shut up, and the fleshed soldier, rough and hard of heart, in liberty of bloody hand, shall range with conscience wide as hell. Now, it's not immediately understandable, but what it means is when you are that fleshy, tough soldier and you've been taught to kill, nothing is going to stop a war once that conflagration has started and the bloody hand shall range. Witness what the Germans did and what we British did back in the early centuries. So we've all been naughty boys, haven't we, at some time? Mm, most certainly. Um, John, in a nutshell, what does the book mean to you? It means, Jason, that at last... I have a compilation of all the negatives and the positives that have made this strange, almost unbearable, sometimes overly joyful life, especially with Jennifer and my two children. It's put everything together in an understandable way so that when I do eventually slip my mortal coil, at least I know that I did achieve something and that I wasn't as bad and as useless as I was originally told I would be and was, and that there is, for all of you out there, you know what the word depression is, you know what the word anxiety is, you know what panic, attack, panic attacks are. I've had them all, and I've had them in spades. The two things I want to say, there's always one person that can help you out. If it isn't God or his son Jesus, if you're not religious like I was for 73 years, then you turn to your best friend. But at the end of the day, unto thine own self be true, maybe. And you've got to help people. 
You've got to give a helping hand to that old woman that's fallen down, that young child that's crying. You've got to, even in this day and age, when every man is a pedophile when he looks at a child, every man is now a rapist, every man is now running drugs. This world, I'm telling you now to your face, I think it is buggered. I think we're going downhill now. Having said that, I've always been an unhappy liver, remember. I've not been happy, happy for that long. I just think we're heading for a lot of trouble. And one of the, <clears throat> one of the glorious things about Sidney Newman giving that creative idea he had about a space traveler and giving it to that wonderful woman whose name I've just forgotten, the producer. Oh, uh, Verity Lambert. Verity Lambert. Verity, if you don't even know me, Verity, you and that Sidney Newman, you are solely responsible for me being here at this moment. Thank God for you and thank God for all of the doctors and thank God for the audience. It's been a wonderful ride and I just wish you the very best and I hope this interview has given you a little insight. Remember, we are not all gregarious. We are not all happy all of the time and some of us do tell the truth. If it doesn't rest easily with you, I'll apologize now. But is there any other way to do it? Can you live with a lie? I don't think so. So may your own particular God go with you. Thank you to Jason and the man you never see, ladies and gentlemen, the cameraman, a handsome young man who's been drinking tea and having gin and tonics while he's been filming us. No, he hasn't really. So that's it. Good night. God bless you. And we'll see you in the future. John, a pleasure to have interviewed you. The book's great. I've, I've enjoyed reading it this week. I think there will be many people that will get great pleasure out of it. Thank you, Jason. Thanks very, very much, John. Thank you.